Tonight, we are delighted to have as our speaker, Jim Butler, formerly of the Naval Research Laboratory, and now a research associate at the Smithsonian Natural History Museum. At NRL, he was head of the Gas Surface Dynamics section, where he researched the fundamental chemical processes of chemical vapor deposition with a particular focus on diamond CBD growth mechanisms, surface chemistry, defect characterization, and applications. Jim earned his SB in chemical physics from MIT and a PhD in chemical physics from the University of Chicago. Tonight, we are pleased to welcome him and to learn about his research into this modern chemical process, which has become critical to the fabrication of many modern electronic materials and devices. It is the true alchemy. Jim Butler. Thank you, Robin. Can you hear this? So this evening, I'd like to talk to you about really two topics. The first one, which I'll devote a few slides to, is what I'm calling modern alchemy. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. And then the second topic, which I'll go into much more depth on, will be the chemical vapor deposition of diamond. That's just one example of what I'm calling this modern alchemy. So alchemy. Did a little bit of research on this to figure out what are the word origins of alchemy? Where did this term come from? And you can find a reference to Kenya, or the Black Earth in Egypt. I suspect, you know, several thousand years ago, the Black Earth was very important, just as it is today for producing foodstuffs. But also, you can find some references in Greek to the art of making metal ingots, or even chumia, the art of extracting. <laughs> but what I prefer to use is what I'll take as sort of the literal translation of the Arabic version of alchemy to really mean the chemistry. And this is something I started using, oh, 30 years ago maybe, to try and highlight the role of chemistry in a lot of the modern technologies that we use. So when you think of alchemy, at least I grew up in the 50s with you know, comic books and things like that. You sort of think of the original alchemists with these guys who in the dark ages disappeared into some you know, castle somewhere and took lead in there and transmuted it into gold. Uh, I think they got a bad rap. I'll tell you why. Because I think they were really the original material scientists of their day. And even if this legend of converting lead into gold were true. And there actually is some archaeological evidence in Israel of costume jewelry that was made to have the same weight or density as gold, actually had a lead alloy, and then was dipped very briefly in gold to give it a gold coating. And I'm sure in those days, before the Dark Ages, that was strictly an economic business. These guys, not everybody could afford gold jewelry, and they weren't all the rulers and the kings. So they wanted to have uh, some nice jewelry. And so there was a market there for costume jewelry. Just as today, there's a market for costume jewelry. So I argue that the original alchemists were nothing more than material scientists. And quite frankly, they got a bad rap in the Dark Ages. So with that, I'm going to argue that what we're doing today is, in fact, alchemy. Because what we do is we can have a watch here. And is that gold? Titanium carbide. It's one of several metals or material systems that we found that give a hard coating that can actually look very much like gold. Actually, after the fall of the Soviet Union, Moscow rebuilt the Cathedral of Christ Savior, and you see these wonderful gold domes on it. But again, they're not gold. Tantalum carbide. Of course, a lot of what we do today, and a lot of the technology we use, is based on what? Sand. We take sand, we convert it through chemistry into these big silicon pools. Some of them are now 18 inches in diameter and weigh several tons. 
Then we slice those bools up. And then, not with machine tools or soldering irons, we create electronic devices by putting down a variety of materials on top of this silicon wafer, both insulators, semiconductors, and metals, but all through processes that involve chemistry. It's all through chemical processes. So I argue that nowadays, we really are the modern alchemists. We take base things like sand, and we convert them into very high-value things and technology. And I guess on the final end of that spectrum, this was a few years ago, this is actually diamond now sitting under the silicon chips for thermal management in a high-performance computing system for NSA. So now let me digress or get to the main part, which is going to be diamond, and ask the question, what is diamond? And I think most people in this audience know that diamond is carbon. It's a crystalline form of carbon, it's a cubic form. I have another model of it here. And I don't know if this will show very well. Probably it's too small. <coughs> but I hold it along one axis, which we call the 111 axis. And I hold this other crystal model on the same axis. This is graphite. You can't tell the difference. But if I rotate them, all of a sudden you see a tremendous difference in that in diamond, we have strong bonding in all three directions, if you will. Whereas in graphite, we only have strong bonding in two directions and very weak bonding in the other direction. And it's actually this bonding in diamond that gives rise to an incredible array of materials properties I'll talk about in a minute. But one of the ones is it has more atoms per unit volume than any other terrestrial material. You combine that with the strength of the carbon-carbon bond, and the fact that it forms this tetrahedral network, and you can easily see why it's one of the hardest materials around. That also gives rise to a lot of other properties of diamond. But as we all know, I think, diamond is really metastable. Graphite is the thermodynamically stable form of carbon under the conditions in which we live. And so if we take graphite and exert pressure on it, we can, in fact, push this down and condense this into diamond. So we know that diamond is sort of the high-pressure stable phase of carbon. In fact, I remember as a young kid, you know, Superman would take this lump of coal, right? And he'd sit there and he'd squeeze real hard on it. And then he'd come up with this nice diamond. The only problem with that was I don't know how he got the temperature hot enough in his hand. Why did he get the pressure and not the temperature? So why are we interested in diamond? Well, there are many reasons for that. But I want to just start from a technological approach, and that has to do with the material property. But there's a lot of other intellectual reasons we're interested in diamond that I'll talk about at the very end of the talk. And that is, if we take a property of a material, and I've made this now for about every material property I can think of. I'm only going to show you one slide on material properties tonight. But it demonstrates something that is very interesting. When you take, say, thermal conductivities of materials, and you put all different materials, silver, silicon carbide, gold, silicon, iron, all on a scale, where is diamond? It's up there. If you take a thermal expansion coefficient, and you put, again, on a scale, where is diamond? It's not the smallest, but it's nearly the smallest. You do this for almost any material property you can think of. The value for diamond lies at one of the extremes or the other. And this combination of these things is really has made diamond an attractive material for technology to enable either high power electronics or high temperature electronics or optics that can withstand the kind of energies that are in our fourth generation synchrotrons, etc. or Biocompatibility, there's a lot of applications that are based on the properties of diamond. So that's why we're interested. If diamond's so great, and there's so many of them in the earth, they mine several millions of carats a year, why don't we use that for technology? And I'd like to show this slide, because this is probably the prettiest diamond I've seen in my life. This is a centenary, it's about 300 carats, polished back in the mid-90s, and it's amazing to see that rotating. I think I can get this one rotated. This is not the centenary. This is actually a replica of a famous diamond that's made by a friend of mine in New York, but it 
you can't distinguish the difference. So gem diamonds are pretty, but they have a problem. In academia, I like to say they're like graduate students. No two are alike. Some are real gems, and some aren't. Or to other audiences, maybe like snowflakes. You know, they all have a different defect structure. And if you're going to build a technology and you want to sell, I don't know, 100 million Intel chips or cell phones or something like that, you want everyone to be the same, not everyone to be different. If you're selling jewelry, you might want everyone to be different so everybody thinks they have a unique stone. So natural diamonds really are useless for most technological applications. Hence the interest for many, many years, actually over a decade of, or sorry, a century, half, 75 years to be more specific, uh, people have been interested in synthesizing diamond and trying to find ways to synthesize diamond. Well, before I got into diamond, I was working on other electronic materials, trying to understand the chemistry of growth. And I went to an electronic materials conference, a Gordon conference in New Hampshire. And there was a rather elderly Japanese gentleman, Professor Sitako, who got up and gave this talk. And his English was not very good. And he showed slides. I don't have a copy of his slides, but they were somewhat similar to this. He showed these little particles. And he claimed that these were diamonds, and that he was growing them in effectively a light bulb. He had a hot tungsten filament. He had a cooled substrate nearby. He would pass hydrogen with this alchemical formula of about half percent methane across this filament, and diamonds would grow on that surface. And the total pressure was only 15 or 20 torr, which is the 20th of, the at of an atmosphere. So very low pressure. And most of the scientists, American scientists, I have to be a little embarrassed to say, didn't believe him. And the questions, unfortunately, he didn't understand, and his English wasn't good enough, so it was just a lack of communication. But at least at NRL, I had exposure to some colleagues who doing a lot of work on combustion chemistry, and all of a sudden, just something clicked. It just looked interesting. So I came back to NRL after seeing this talk, and I got a group of my colleagues together for lunch one day, and I said, hey guys, I just heard this great talk at the Gordon Conference, and I think here's a topic we ought to, you ought to be interested in. I wasn't because I already had a program on plasma chemistry and looking at gallium arsenide growth and things, and I was just, I felt too busy. I was happy with what I was doing, etc. cetera. And uh, about halfway through this lunch meeting, et cetera, our division had walked in, and everybody else shut up. So they learned that they didn't speak too loudly in front of your division head. And I was stuck there at the board sort of explaining what I had seen. And half an hour later, our boss walks in the office and says, Jim, guess what? You're going to put up a proposal in diamond. I said, no way. I got all this other stuff. I don't want to do it. He said, no, Jim, we really think you ought to do it. Of course, they're the boss. They, they pay the bills. Uh, all right, so I put up a proposal. I didn't get into this field by choice. However, I have to actually give those managers some credit in hindsight. I'm very glad they kicked my butt into this field. It's been a lot of fun, and I'll show you a little bit of some of the things that we've been able to do. So here's another scanning electron micrograph of a small cumulonidrogen crystal of diamond. This bar is two and a half microns thick, so this is a very tiny crystal. This is one of the first ones we grew. But we also grew something else that was very interesting. These are diamonds. Now, if you know anything about carbon chemistry, you've probably heard about buckyballs, these things that look like soccer balls. And of course, when I was in graduate school working on crystals and studying space group theory, etc., I was told there was no five-fold axis of symmetry. And what am I looking at here? Then I learned about twin. That's actually another whole secret there. It's one of the problems of secret. So the twinning of the crystal can actually form these five-fold axes of symmetry. So you can actually have solid diamond that looks exactly like a soccer ball or bucky balls. So here's the, the, the conundrum. How are we growing this stuff? How is this stuff forming, particularly at low pressures? So that's what was really curious. So we know there's really three ways of growing diamond now. There's nature, 
nature started growing diamonds, the oldest ones that the geologists have dated about four billion years old. So we know that most natural diamonds are actually grown several billion years ago. We have high pressure, high temperature synthesis of diamond that started in the 50s, with both in Sweden and here in this country. And that can create grit of a certain size that's used on a lot of saw blades and cutting and polishing and milling. But it doesn't create big wafers or plates of diamond that might be useful for some of the technologies. So it's this new field, this chemical vapor of this deposition of diamond, where we get to play God in a sense. By understanding and controlling that, we can now engineer the material to the application. So this was the understand, this is a uh, phase diagram showing pressure on this axis. One atmosphere is, let's see, in the of Pascal's down in this range, where high pressure, high temperature grow is at about 5 million atmospheres and an elevated temperature. And that was the only way of making synthetic diamond until CVD came along. CVD grows diamond down in this regime both at lower temperatures and at lower pressures. And we, it is diamond, you take my word for that. So the real question is why? And so that's what we embarked on trying to study. And so we set up, and this is my background at the time, was laser diagnostics of chemical processes, particularly gas-based chemical processes. So we set up our light bulb, you don't see it in here, but there was a hot filament. This picture I show sort of two filaments here. And we made a reactor we could move around in the laser beams, and we could study the gas composition between the hot filaments and the substrate where diamonds grow. So we could understand a little bit about the chemical environment that was there. And what we, we use a variety of laser techniques, and we'll try to go through all of these. But basically, infrared spectroscopy, resonance enhanced multifoton ionization, this is third harmonic generation coherent anti-stokes, Raman spectroscopy, which is fancy laser techniques that measure the concentrations of certain species or measure the temperature of the gas, as cars does, for example. And what we detected was, of course, we knew we were putting hydrogen into the reaction and methane, but we detected a fair bit of atomic hydrogen. This hot filament is associating molecular hydrogen into atomic hydrogen. And not surprisingly to any chemist, if you're starting with methane and you have another radical reaction species, you're going to generate other radical species, such as the methyl radical, CH3. And ultimately, this was an interesting insight, the settling was forming. Now, settling then immediately ticks off, if you again, you're sort of a gas-based chemist, a zero-order model for what's going on in the gas phase. If I take a tin can and I put half percent methane and hydrogen into that tin can and I heat it to a temperature and I wait till everything reaches equilibrium, I can calculate the concentration of every species in that can very easily. And that's what this calculation shows. It shows the temperature of 1500 Kelvin. Now I can see I'm decomposing methane, I'm forming a settling, and I have some atomic hydrogen, some methylene, and actually some methyl radical, etc. So this immediately tells you that while we know we have a reactor where the gases are flowing in and flowing out, we're not in equilibrium. But this equilibrium model actually gives a good approximation of what's going on in the gas phase. We measured the atomic hydrogen, which is actually very difficult to measure. Now when we compare that to the amount that you would get from the gas temperature in equilibrium, we see we have a huge concentration of atomic hydrogen, much more than one would expect from the temperature of the gases. That means we have a supersaturation of atomic hydrogen. So let me sort of give you the overall picture of the CBD again, sort of summarize some of these things. We have a container, a reactor, stainless steel walls or glass walls. Into this reactor, we're going to feed gases. In this case, it's hydrogen and methane. These reactants are going to go through a region in which chemical reactions are going to start from either the hot filament, or now more typically we use plasmas or combustion flames to start these reactions. 
But since this is at a reasonable pressure, meaning say a twentieth of an atmosphere or anywhere from ten to several hundred to four, uh, these reactions are going to go on continuously as these molecules collide with each other while the fluid is flowing and being transported down to where you're going to deposit diamond. So there's a lot of complexity going on in here from a chemical engineering point of view. You can have convection cells, you can have force flow. Ultimately, when you get close to the substrate, you have what we call uh, diffusion barrier layers and thermal barrier layers. And ultimately, what's going to cause the diamond to grow is what makes it all the way to here. So there's a lot of complexity in the gas phase. And in fact, I argue that diamond chemical vapor deposition is, in fact, the best example of all the complexity you can have in almost any kind of CBD, PBD, or reactive ion etching process. And this is an experimental reactor where we're using the plasma now to activate the gas. This is just a close up looking in the window. This is a silicon wafer on which we're rolling down on this in the diamond film. And you can see the gas plasma. Of course, if you work at NRL, and I'm on the south side of our days, we have the blue planes. And if you have a bottle that says, gee, it doesn't really matter what hydrocarbon you put into the reactor, it doesn't take much brains, and you're also thinking about alchemy in another sense, to say, gee, let's just go get some solution gas and run it. So I did this for American Chemical Society. And uh, it was for a diamond drive fuel symposium I organized. And then the PR officer at our lab got wind of it. And, uh, came and said, we want to do a press release. And being a government employee who's, you know, we don't all have all the funding we'd like to have. And just we do care about how the public perceives us. Uh, it just didn't seem to be wise to be going out and saying that these government employees were having fun, you know, turning sewer gas into diamonds. So I said, no. And that ended it for about a month. And he came back and said, no. The captain says we're going to do a press release. And the captain's the head of the laboratory. So I negotiated and said, we will do three press releases. We will do one first on science, the model that I've sort of shown you here that led to this. We'll do another one on, I'm going to show you in a second, which is growth of diamond and combustion flames. And then we can do this one. Of course, the first two, nobody paid any attention to. And this one went ballistic when it was put on the Associated Press. And for about a year, I got nothing done except answering radio. Another consequence of this early model was I was visiting Japan in early 88, and one of my Japanese colleagues uh, had pointed out that there was a report in one of their applied physics meetings of a young professor in the of Technology growing diamonds with an oxy torch in here. And they thought this was about as ridiculous as we originally thought of the Japanese growing diamonds film. And it's just like a light bulb goes off and it wasn't my idea. But if you knew combustion chemistry, and now you understand a little bit about the gas phase chemistry, it was obvious. So we went back and we immediately reproduced it and you know, prodded him and exchanged it anyway. So you can now grow diamond literally in here with a simple oxy torch in your garage. And this has been done by a number of high school students now for science projects. And the way you do that the oxy torch is a very interesting flame to study. Uh, it has really three flames here. When you first light an you know, oxy torch is a premix of oxygen and acetylene. When you light that flame and you start it, you have a fluid flow here, and yes, the chemical reaction speed that generates the stable flame front. So this is what we call a premix flame front. And if you exactly have the stoichiometric right, you will only see this premixed flame front, and then you'll see an outer flame where the hot product gases of this flame front, which is basically hot CO, react with the oxygen in the air to form CO2 in the water. But if you now have the flame a little bit fuel rich, too much carbon, so here you've now used up all the oxygen to form CO, and I have a little extra carbon left over to get this intermediate flame, which the welders would call the acetylene feather. And the chemistry that propagates in this flame front is really H atom or OH, depending on whether it's fuel lean or fuel rich. So H atoms, one of our important ingredients, little extra carbon saturation in this thing. The obvious thing is, all right, 
let's just put the surface in there, and if we keep it at 900 degrees C, which is not an easy feat, actually, you can literally watch the little tiny diamonds grow. In 10 minutes, you can have something you can see in a microscope very easily. Now, it's a fun technique. It turns out, from a practical point of view, for industry, while it's a very simple thing, very low capital equipment, it's very hard to control. And we've tried for several years to do this, and so there's nobody I know in the world that's using this as a production technique for that. It's just a curiosity. So now I'm going to delve a little bit more into the chemistry. And of course, the real chemistry of any material growth is going to be on the surface. And that's where you're adding atoms or molecules to the material. Okay, so I decided to set up a group to study the surface chemistry of diamond. It turns out there are only two or three papers that have been published on the surface chemistry of diamond. And what do you need to do? Well, you want to know the structure. You want to know the composition. But we're really chemists. We want to know what molecule or molecular entities are on the surface. So we focus a lot on vibration spectrum. But all of these surface science techniques require what we call ultra-high vacuum. This is a vacuum where if you have a clean surface, it stays clean for the order of minutes and hours as opposed to seconds, which means there has to be very few molecules in it. So you build this huge technology of ultra-high vacuum chamber with all these spectroscopies on it. But then there's another problem. Where do you get large single crystal lens? Now there, being a scientist, uh, you just go bang. And fortunately, years, Harry Winston, these people actually coughed up some big diamond pieces for us to study. Okay, now we've got the big diamond pieces. How do you polish a diamond? Well, the traditional way is a cast iron scythe at 3,000 RPM. That's still probably the best way to polish some crystal diamond. But when you polish diamond, you introduce damage to the surface. In fact, if you look at the surface, this is an atomic force microscope. They look like pomegranate because they're being polished by diamond particles and that cast iron going by at very high speed and just put grooves into it. This is not a high quality surface. The surface science, you really wanted to study a high quality surface. You take um, single crystal copper or nickel or something like that. You cut it at the right angle so you knew what the structure should be. You put it in this UHV chamber. He then pump all the gases out. He sputter the reliance and damage the surface and blow things off the surface, all the impurities. Then he would kneel it so it recrystallized. He'd go through this like 20 times before he had a nice, clean metal surface. The diamond, you sputter it with ions, you damage it. You anneal it, you turn it to graphite. Not done. This is not a way to make clean diamond surfaces. So we found solutions to these. Uh, we'll go through all of them. We can now polish diamond to essentially one extra RMS roughness. So here's a very flat PFM picture. And we developed a plasma processing technique that basically etches away all of the non-diamond or damaged diamond on the surface. So I show a plasma here with four diamonds at about 900 degrees C. And these pictures are reverse view electron diffraction pictures. They're basically pictures that are the result of diffraction off the top atoms on the surface. And with the lower the voltage you do this, and still keep very sharp diffraction spots means you're only probing the top atomic layer. So we can show that this surface is a sharp diffraction spot down to, in this case, down to 7 volts, but I think this picture is 18 volts or 16 volts. The other interesting thing you see is the diffraction pattern has a 2 by 1 reconstruction. So if I were to take, and it happens to be on this particular surface, this is the 1, 0, 0 surface, this surface, as I've constructed it here, would have a one-by-one one diffraction pattern. But what happens is it's hydrogen terminated, and the hydrogens are too close together. So the surface actually has to rearrange itself, and you lose pairs of hydrogens and form these dimer bonds to form this two-by-one pattern on the surface. That actually has important implications for some of the chemical mechanisms, which I won't discuss later. Gloss over. But here's some pictures of diamond surfaces, hydrogen terminated. So we came up with a way to now prepare surfaces so we can study them and understand the surface chemistry. So, diamond is hydrogen terminated. Let me point out a couple of other things. In chemistry, probably the single most important parameter is the temperature of the medium in which you do the chemistry. 
Temperature seems to control reactivity molecules. Reactions either have activation barriers, they don't. Temperature is what helps you get over that, etc. So, so what are the important temperatures of life? Well, we're growing by at about 900 degrees C, more typically 600 to 1200, and you can even extend the range further to maybe 300, 1400, if there was a sort of extreme ranges. What do those temperatures really mean in chemistry? Well, the surface at 900 degrees C is a funny thing. It's hot. Molecules, any molecule that comes down on that surface will not stick around on there unless it forms a chemical bond. Physium sort of molecules back off the gas stage real quick. And even the carbon carbon or carbon hydrogen bond, which is amongst the stronger chemical bonds, can be broken at 900 degrees C. Slowly, but they can be broken. So we have to have essentially a direct mechanism. Reaction. But there's another important thing for diamond. This comes back to sort of the structure of diamond. Diamond has a very high divine touch. The lattice itself is cold. In other words, these atoms, the way I built this model, are not moving at all, it's going to be zero degrees cold. Many real temperature, all of these atoms are sort of jiggling a little bit, right? And the divine temperature is actually a parameter that we use that relates to the derived heat capacity of materials, but it really relates to the motion of the atoms in the lattice and when they sort of lose their quantum mechanical nature and sort of become statistical in nature. And one thing I've observed over the years of working with a variety of materials is that if I'm going to grow a high quality single crystal of silicon, or germanium, or mercant or any sort of covalent material, it always happens within 10% of twice the divide temperature, not half the now, what does this mean? It means the lattice is cold. There's very little motion in this lattice. So if we have a defect that we build in, it stinks. It's not going to be any low. So diamond right now is just showing two very unique things about chemistry that's different than most other chemistry of materials that are in the product. So let me run you through some just back of the envelope calculations. I mentioned pressure. Can you come up to one atmosphere? here? That's 764. More typically, it's about 104. We're growing primarily in hydrogen. We have a low percentage of hydrocarbon. We're dissociating this hydrogen by the plasma layer for typically the 10 to 20 to 40 percent association of a lot of atomic hydrogen. What this means is that the flux of atomic hydrogen to the surface is of the order of really 10 to 21 atoms per square centimeter per second hitting the surface. Now, the surface of the diamond only has two or three times 10 to 15, depending on the surface you pick, atoms per square centimeter. So this means that every surface hydrogen that's turned into a carbon is seeing an incoming hydrogen essentially every microsecond. This surface is being bombarded with atomic hydrogen. And what happens? First thing that happens is this atomic hydrogen can react with this hydrogen to form molecular hydrogen, leaving an unsaturated valence or magnetic bond on the surface. And that has an activation energy and a certain probability of reaction. This unsaturated valence or magnetic bond could react immediately with another incoming hydrogen and it fills it. And the only thing that's happened is we've just taken two gas phase hydrogen, recombined them with the surface to get molecular hydrogen. The heat of that reaction stays in the surface, so all we've done is heat the surface. But the point I'm trying to make is there's a high turnover of these hydrogen atoms on the surface. Possibly coming off and going back on the surface. So here's three picoseconds in the lifetime of the mechanics simulation that we did. And in that three picoseconds, if you really watch carefully, let's see if we can repeat this again. I think you may see back here, yes, right there, there was one diamond wand being filled. In three picoseconds, not much happened except we had a lot of these atomic hydrogen collisions to the surface. So I'm going to give you sort of now a simple way of describing diamond. So let's talk about this. I already mentioned that we have a hydrogen extraction of the magnetic bond. Now, since the gas phase has these hydrocarbon radicals, typically a double radical, that can come in and react with that magnetic bond. So now I have a CH group bonded on top of the surface. And all that is 
will, which is another chemical on the surface. Everything's covered with hydrogen. So really, it didn't, this is not growing now. This just added one carbon. So that's not dynamic growth. We can have abstraction, both from the surface hydrogens, and also from that CH3 group. So you can now generate radicals of the dynamic form that is here, so this radical that is absorbed. And now we can have another CH3 group coming in, and so you can really add, you can grow, you can imagine this linear chain of alkane on the surface by this hydrogen abstraction and then radical absorption. But that is not quite what happens, because there's a very important reaction in organic chemistry called the beta scission reaction. I know this is derived, but this actually is what I call the English lawnmower reaction. It's what keeps the chains of alkanes from not growing on the diamond surface. This is a situation where if you have a long alkane, or this could be a diamond surface, and we have a two-carbon group on the surface, hydrogen is trapped from the terminal group. Have a high temperature pathway in which basically this bond can break, this electron goes back to so that electron becomes methylene going back to the gasoline. You've basically got a two carbon unit off the chain. This is how gasoline is made. This is a catalytic cracking to get uh, shorter chains of gasoline. And as the temperatures are growing, this reaction has a significant growth rate. So its effect is that as we're trying to grow diamond, the hydrocarbon absorbing of the surface is going to be primarily the C1 species. If I have a C2 absorbate, the beta scission is going to cut it off. If I have a C3, then beta scission is going to cut that back to a C1. So it's pretty rare to find C2 or larger hydrocarbons on the diamond surface. And I'll sort of finish with the chemistry with this last sort of hand wave slice. The question is, how does diamond really grow? What's really going to happen is we're going to have a hydrogen abstraction from that absorbate and a hydrogen abstraction from a nearby chemical site. Then a radical radical reaction that's going to basically give you now two bonds back in the lattice. And depending on the particular stereo chemistry, I'm just not writing about this model, but I have to show you all the stereo chemical possibilities. This is essentially how diamond is being grown. Those hydrogen exchange reactions are literally dehydrogenating that hydrocarbon that absorbs on the surface to grow that carbon back into the lattice. So, let me back up here. So this generic mechanism published quite a few years ago, if you want to read one paper alone, this is a fairly short paper, but all of that is sort of covered there. You really want to understand much more the stereochemistry and the gory details. This is a more recent paper. And for another series, we uh, they kind of did the animation course and sort of speeded up the diamond growth. And you can sort of see the plasma up here, the various species of hydrogen abstraction, the carbon radicals, and that's sort of our vision as to how diamond is growing by C D. So now I'm going to change topics a little bit, we'll stay on time. We're going to talk more about the material and the applications than just what's the growth chemistry. We're now at the point where there are large reactors. This is a 80 kilowatt reactor that can grow diamond over 16 inches in diameter. There's various different technologies, etc. We've demonstrated that we can grow, in principle, diamond as low as a dollar a carat from just the production costs, not figuring out. Uh, uh, that includes the materials, the labor, and the depreciation of capital equipment, not the markup or what we would ultimately sell it. What I'd like to point out now is by controlling this chemistry, we really can engineer this material. So we have really a continuum of CDB 9 materials. On one scale, there's a material that was started growing in our national labs, which they call ultra nanocrystalline diamond. This is a material with the grain size of each diamond crystallite stays about 5 to 10 nanometers in size. So they're really about the size of this model in atoms. But there's a layer of graphitic and amorphous carbon between each of these grains. So it's a bulk material, but it has a lot of defects in it, and it has a lot of non diamond carbon. The next material is one that we grow at NRL called nanocrystalline diamond. And the trick there is we put down a very high 
high density of very small vitamin C. It's about three nanometers in size, which are made in Russia by explosive devices. It's a whole other talk itself. And once we have one layer of those seeds, we start growth and immediately switch to very high quality diamond growth conditions. So once the diamond starts, the grains have very few impurities, the grain boundaries are high quality. And this gives rise to a different set of properties of that material. If you were to grow it much thicker, we grow what we call polycrystal material. This is happening a little bit. And I polish the sides. You can sort of see the grain composition that goes on. We have a high nucleation density here. And this is what I used to call back in the 90s, probably politically incorrect, the model grain crystal growth effect. That is, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, because those crystals are going faster to overgrow those crystals that don't. Single crystal material has been grown for over a decade now. This is what I call the Apollo Rose. It's a single crystal plant grown by CBD with a particular defect I'll talk about a little bit later. It gives rise to the color. And if you do the number of large single crystal areas, number of groups that's involved with the NRL, techniques is taking multiple single crystals, aligning them very well, and then growing them together. So you can actually make a tile large place to find. But this is just one of the spectrum that you can have. Another you know, spectrum could be, for example, defects, say white diamond, a lot of gray to thermal magnet, gray diamond, cheaper to date, but does it have the same property? Has it been the thermal magnet, even the optical properties? So there's a whole series of different material skills that we can engineer just by controlling the process. So let's talk a little bit about surfaces. So we demonstrated in our surface chemistry that we had a hydrogen surface. We now know how to take that surface and convert it to an oxygen terminated surface. This is the hydrophobic, this is the hydrophilic. We can do various types of thermal oxidation to make the thin layer of the SS2 carbon on there. More importantly, we now demonstrated things like the Lewis-Lohr reaction or other chemical reactions we can find. Specific molecules as long as the diamond surface is well oriented to well. So, this is the 2 plus 2 addition, which doesn't occur in the acid stage. And the 4 plus 2, which does occur in the acid stage. But the reason is this is symmetry forbidden. At the surface, it can occur if you don't have the same symmetry for the acid stage. So, we've used these two reactions to generate bases now, putting molecules on the diamond surface and work with Bob Andrews. We found ways to make a carbon carbon bond of a thinker molecule that ultimately we can attach a single strand DNA to. We can then use this to a sensor to find the complementary through the base and they match this and you can go through this. This is one of the beauties of hydrogen, I'm sorry, of diamond, is that that liquid molecule was a hydrolyze. If you do this as a silicon, this is a dioxide, it goes back on to three, and ultimately every time we do nature. Your senses, you lose signal. Whereas diamond seems to be utilized to recover, because basically the food used organic chemistry was made in back on analysis. I mentioned genetic ecosystem diamond uh, has a number of very interesting properties. And I'll show you some examples of that. It has its own diamond, essentially, that has single crystal diamond. It has a remarkably high thermal diffusivity for a nano ecosystem material. Uh, what else is that? It's incredibly tough. And then we're going to this is only one micron thick. If you put it on a, say, a 60 millimeter aperture, it will hold two atmospheres of pressure. It's not like a then out of the diamond is just almost a brittle material. Do that as a like a fracture. This is a neat progress. And what we're trying to explain with that for a number of things. This is probably my favorite picture of our nano system diamond. This is what's a call our nano tennis diamond. It's done in five vibrations. It's very Lydia's is hard as we're asked to do right now. The, it's like a silicon vapor. The silicon vapor had a thermal oxide layer on it. Onto that thermal oxide, you deposited 30 nanometers, 300 angstroms of a nanometer material. Then we use electron beam lithography to pattern this to create this little pattern, which we want to use as a processor, basically. 
Then in the spiral of that, another 30 nanometers of gold, which is this is the final direction. 30 nanometers of diamond, 30 nanometers of gold. This is the falsest color of the system. So you can see how that gold shadow is through this mask. And then on the several thousands of these that she made on the waiting room, she called me on Friday night and said, I found this specimen particle. Mm -hmm. So there's the one micron diameter tennis ball. Mm -hmm. And if you look a little carefully, there is a hundred nanometer ping pong ball. But what the blue micron, being the materials as I do this, is that only 300 inches thick, there are no breaks in these lines. This is a nanometer system material that has no breaks, it's fully dense, etc. And it has a number of remarkable properties. So I'll try to demonstrate at least one here. So there's a technology that's been in, in use for a lot of things recently called uh, microelectrical chemical systems, MNS systems. In fact, probably the most common one is the accelerometer of your car for the airbags. So if you have a collision, it's a little MNS device, it's going to switch it to the kill that turns on the air. But they're also used as a lot of other things as GPS units, and I think I'm going to have like that too for figuring out which way it's on, etc. But one of the applications that they get a lot of research and interest in is as a front end of uh, our communication devices. So you have a here an antenna that picks up all the different signals that are out there. Imagine this is yourself. And you have to have some front end that filters out all of that stuff I'm not interested in. The signal from the monitor system. You have to pick up the frequencies that you want, etc. And the traditional way, the way most of the cell phones are made now, is these are discrete devices that are in the doctors and capacitors and things like that, creating these resonance circuits. Uh, with MEMS, you can now make thousands of them in the area that are the size of any one of those discrete devices. So you can make these cell phones and communication devices small. And you can solve a couple problems. We can also make it much more energy efficient, so you don't have to have that big battery. Yeah. So this is the goal of the project. This is another the by vibrations of Clark on the Genesis group when he's a university physician. He's now on the group. And so one of his measures is to use some of our nanomaterial, namely the boron on those diamond films, about a micron thick that we grew. And he processed it, I don't know the all steps here, but it's a complicated stage. Essentially, what he's trying to gain is thinking of the drummer symbol, thinking of the taxon, and the ring for the moment, is making a disk. He wants this disk to have a high resonance frequency and to store that energy for a long time. We call that the Q, is the sort of quality factor of the resonance. And then he's going to couple into that through an electrode. So this is the input signal. And if the input signal was resonant with this, it would then couple to the output of the electrode. But if it's not resonant with this signal, then the input signal will cause this to do anything. There will be no response here. So this is a classic filter that we can use. And this is what the actual devices look like. Here's the boron of the line. Polysilicon support most of the signal line. And the dimensions here are about 10 microns. The size of this is about 1 micron thick. This is a chemical device oscillates in the microwave. These are acoustic microwaves, if you will. 1.5 gigahertz. That's already above the cell phone frequencies. And the other amazing thing is the quality factor is over 11,000. This is an incredibly good one for a resonator. And particularly, the resonator frequency is not that well in fact, it's really good figure in there. And that now will roll back for the number of years as our MS is the most. Now, we've gone on further with these devices in our analysis. We're now going to make a range of these resonators, couple of them, and essentially use them as a photonic crystal, if you will, and study their properties. So now I'll turn to another application. There's two groups in the world right now working on artificial sweatband products. Now, why did they make interesting to diamond from our artificial sweatband? Now, the reason is, is diamond means solid carbon. It turns out a lot of myelin molecules adhere to it very nicely in some of them. And the second is that you can dole it with the boron and make it electrically compatible. So here you have an electrode that's myelin compatible and you can have a greater body. So there's two teams, one of them in the US and one in France. The one in the US approach is going to be to take a silicon chip, encapsulate it in a diamond film, and then have a conductive diamond just where you need it. Basically, we would plant the 
silicon chip in the body. The body is able to react with the silicon and the silicon dioxide and break it. It's not how I have to have it. So you need a hermetic seal around it to be able to put it in the body. So that's the U.S. approach. The French approach is a little bit different. Uh, I think they're a little further along. They have a little line of electrodes here embedded in a polyimid. This is polyimid and that is what's going to be implanted in my retina. And so the patient is now going to have a little detector on the side of his body that plugs into the CCC camera. And without the diamond, it's not even demonstrated, but not the diamond again that has the electrode. With just standard metal electrodes, they've already demonstrated 64 by 64 in human subjects to be seen with the assistance. So I'm going to turn to another form of land. This is single crystal land. So here are some single crystal land that's been grown by a polymer company. And here's one that was grown two years ago at the Carnegie Institute in Washington. Carnegie's interest is in commercial physics. And so their interest is getting larger and larger by the animal cells to can study the higher pressures that they can generate in those cells. Of course, synthetics can be diamond and be made into genetics. And uh, element six is the old Beers Industrial Division, funded by the Beers. They developed very good technology for an eye quality diamond and obviously demonstrated gems. But they are, because the parent companies, businesses, like a $10 million business, is natural diamonds, they are absolutely forbidden to sell or make any of these for sale, growing for demonstration purposes. Uh, this is the Carnegie Institution using diamond animal cells. Which they can actually develop a prototype and plan different electronic devices in the animal cells to study new areas of magnetic physics. And then this is the Apollo rose over here. Single crystal line and that's a rose color. That color comes from a nitrogen in the lattice position with an adjacent vacancy or lactic part, which we call the NV center. This NV center acts like a molecule. And it has, in the negative and charge state, a very interesting property. The ground state is a spin triplet. Now, okay, we have a material that has essentially no magnetic moment in it, it's isotopy pure, carbon 13 and the one system of elements. We have a high magnetic temperature, so it's a very, very low ocean. So now if you can make a quantum state in this triplet state, it's going to stay in that for a long time because there's not no fluctuating fields around come up to take it out. So the quantum computing, quantum encryption, you know, a lot of work on our world right now for the last five years on this. We demonstrated it the spin, spin lifetime, the spin and relaxation of that quantum state was on the millisecond time scale, even in a poor quality time. It's now not about the invention of that. One of the applications of this NA center is it has a very strong electric light transition, almost like a sub and that means that you can optically pump it and then emit a photon. And of course, you have one empty center, and it emits a photon, and it emits another photon at the same time. So it has been actually commercialized now as a single photon source. And one of the big applications in commercial is it's quantum photography. But the idea is you have a single photon source here with Alice, and she is going to send single photons and then out to the fiber. And some of the photons will be polarized this way. That's the state is it's the polarization system. And the other thing is Baha. Alice is going to tell Baha, I just sent you 137 photons. And so Baha is this theory, this is a chemical photons. And if he gets 137 and knows the measures of polarization of each, he now has the cryptic word. However, if he is a there, and she's going to assume all that fiber, the only way she can assume is to detect a photon. So she detects one of those photons as a fiber. Oh, this is getting it. So if he gets the word that only has 136 photons in it, he knows D is there. Forget that that word just a few And then continue on. So that's the principle behind the single photon sources. I think we'll come up close here with another application that's not CCP related. Uh, about five or six years ago, I got involved in the Smithsonian Institution, where Jim Post and curators of Jim and Neurology came and said, Jim, you know, we've got all these valuable things and interests and diamonds. What good science can we do? And so we brought that. And it turned out while we were doing this, on the loan to this, it was this beautiful one of the books that we saw it was there. It has almost a very cool over rainbow. And uh, Alan Bronstein put this together, they actually put together several of these, and they're going to pressure using 
and so on. So we have a suite of guidelines that we can start to study. And what's interesting about these guidelines? Well, if you look at the Aurora collection, many of these guidelines are threats. And if they have a color, it means they have a defect. Or some kind of staining in there. And that staining then in the light is how much of the UV photos And that helps us characterize the nature of the state. And of course, it's one of our goals as technology, understanding the nature of these things. This is going to be important to many of the technologies. But even more fun, this is what we can't show you this evening. It's the whole dialing in a dark room where you illuminate it with an ultraviolet lighting and then turn it off and then it'll go like a red hot coal in the minutes in your hand. And unfortunately, we've got 600 school kids in the museum room. You can't turn all the lights off. You can't have a message. It's even all recorded in the history. But this is the first observed about 67 years ago. And it was thought to be unique to the whole time. But this was something very significant. So we tried to study this. The first thing we did is here's the whole time. Here's the phosphorescence. Here's the spectrum. The way we like distribution across the visible. And the light emission versus time, this is 160 seconds out here, so this is zero seconds. So you can see two bands, one at 660 minutes, that's the red band, and it has this very long half light. And there's also a the blue band, a rock band, here at 500 meters, a little shorter and more forward. And that tells you why the system is red band. But we had in that world actually about 15 or 16 other islands. And most of them, this is what this response is had. And this is what we can get in our system. And so over the last six years, we've looked at close to 120 islands now. Let's put that in perspective. Even the beers by my trading company has has over 120 blue islands. This is how we're right now. You know, the gemologists are sort of get a mind below the top. Now, what happened in the TV form, we have to go back and people alone to this. But we built up a wide database of some pages What we believe this is, is what we call a donor accepted comparator of the function in the system. It's not a system process, but it is something that relates very strongly back to how we might use the system. So, this is a case where we're learning the natural trials is going to be beneficial to us for. Uh, Technology. So let me close with these slides. I hope I've convinced you that the diamond age, we can grow very high in the diamond position. And hydrogen hydrogen is sort of the key ingredient that enables us to grow those material in these industrial conditions. We can engineer and control materials and properties. And we can take advantage of these properties for really a wide range of applications that they have had the time you know, to touch on here. Another aspect of the planet, which I think is intellectually very exciting, is it's primarily carbon. This is one of the smallest atoms. It has very few electrons. So it's easy to model theoretically. And of course, the surface is going to involve hydrogen terminating. So again, that's an easy model, model to get more atoms as well. So we can really do detailed definition of calculations, which allow us to calibrate various types of potentials that could be useful for other materials. And we can build all our knowledge of organic chemistry, combustion chemistry, and atmospheric chemistry. So a lot of things really came together in understanding climate CCD. And I would argue the end of this climate CCD is to have one other fields. And of course, this was not done in vacuum. I have to acknowledge many people that are most important in my life are Shaw. Uh, but the colleagues at MRL and the Ryan And in closing, I'd like to show a little uh, cartoon I made. We are the modern elements. And so we made a alchemy field, one hundred percent of the period here is alchemy chemistry. And we picked four symbols of degree of earth, water. For wind, we got a very intelligent emulsion. 
synthesizes halogen because he knows it's the calcium carbonyl. And he goes and he finds his calcium carbonyl and chooses it, takes his big bowl of water, water reacts with calcium carbonyl suddenly, exhales, of course, when he exhales, it's exhaling suddenly with oxygen, as I demonstrated with the oxygen set of torch, which you grow right in. So this is right in the axis of the tools. So we've got that river water within fire. Anyway, thank you for your Boron sits about 0.37 eV above the valence band, so well, it makes it a p-type semiconductor, but a reasonably deep one. What's the what kind of conductivity do you it's get? It's a p-type. It means it's going to be whole conduction. No, I mean, what's the typical doping level? What's Na? Ah, uh, in natural diamonds that we're showing here, the blue diamonds, we've measured the boron concentration, and the maximum we've ever found is about 6 times 10 to the 16, which is low. In CVD diamonds, we can get it up to essentially uh, 10 to the 21, and it becomes a superconductor at low temperatures. Yeah, the, do they all ionize? What? Do they all ionize? You said something about 3, 0.3 EV? Yeah. Okay. They essentially form a semi-metallic band at the top. Thank you. Yes? Um, in your second and third slide, you have a look like a phase diagram. The graphite over the major phase, um, diamonds at higher pressure, and liquid at the lower higher temperature. And you plunk chemical, chemical vapor deposition made diamonds, plunk in the middle of the graphite phase. Correct. Doesn't it convert? Does it convert? Yeah, I mean, since it's unstable relative to graphite at the you know, pressure and temperature. It's a good question. You know, they, De Beers has this advertising logo, diamonds are forever. But diamonds at room temperature are metastable. Now, what I showed in the previous slide was the difference in energy is about half a kcal per mole. But the activation energy barrier you have to get over to get from one form to the other is about 90 kcal per mole or higher. So it turns out if you have a diamond, you can heat it in a vacuum up to just about its divide temperature, 1600 Kelvin, before it starts to turn to graphite. If you heat it in an oxidizing environment, air, it'll start to burn about 600 degrees C. Yes, you have a question. Is there a significant amount of diamond formed in a normal combustion engine that might be associated with wear? And the second question is, do we find any in the solar wind? Uh, so the first question, which was, do we think there's any significant amount of diamond formed in an internal combustion engine? I think the answer to that is no, because most internal combustion engines want to run either neutral or slightly oxidizing, not lean, not, uh, not fuel rich. And also, you have to have a surface at the right temperature in the combustion growth. If just where most combustion flames, like the oxy is at 3,000 degrees, at that high a temperature, the diamond would you know, just or not. So we don't have all the conditions right in the internal combustion engine. And the other question was, are there diamonds in the solar wind? I'm going to interpret that question as, are there diamonds in space? And the answer is yes. We find lots of nano diamonds and meteorites. In radio astronomy, there are a few bands that correspond to the diamond CH modes that are seen. So there is, I think, a very plausible situation where a diamond is being grown in these interstellar plasma clouds, uh, and there could be significant quantities. And then there was many years ago an article in, I think it was the New York Times, about a, and here I'm not the astronomer, so John you may have to help me out with this. Um, in a black hole, ultimately everything's going to go to carbon, and it's high pressure, 
high temperature, what's the stable form of carbon? It, it must be, you know, the largest diamond in the universe must be these black holes. Now, the interesting thing about this story was it was published on February 14th of the following year. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, the question is, uh, you mentioned that the um, diamonds, you can create these diamonds fairly cheaply, in a dollar a carat. Is it cheap enough that you can use it for carbon sequestration? Can you get more carbon out than you put in? And, uh, I have not. Okay, the question is, could we use diamond as a way of sequestering carbon? Well, one of the things I hope I've tried to convince you of is this role of atomic hydrogen and how much atomic hydrogen I have to make to grow diamond. So I have on the order of probably 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 7th atomic hydrogen atoms that I have to make to get one carbon to grow into the diamond lattice. That is not very energy efficient. Was making that atomic hydrogen, I have to dissociate hydrogen to atomic hydrogen. So the answer is no. I don't think this would ever be a good way of carbon. Well, it would work. I understand that flour explodes if there's oxygen mixed with it. Would uh, diamond dust explode also? In principle, it could. Uh, there's an, well, actually, I've seen this experiment. Well, I've seen this accident in the lab. Some of you who've worked in chemistry labs have worked with liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen, if you leave, sit out in the door for too long, converts to liquid oxygen. There'll always be a little bit of liquid oxygen. And the mistake that a lot of us do, we come in the next morning, oh, it's a little bit stuff here, you dump it on the floor, you know? And fortunately, not much happens. Well, we had one graduate student in our lab who actually dumped it in the sink. And the sink had some organic solvents in there. There was a detonation. We were pulling glass out of him, and he couldn't hear for about two hours. I mean, it was really dramatic. So here's, with that background, here's the question. I have pure liquid oxygen. I take a five carat diamond. I heat it with a torch till it's glowing red hot, and I drop it in the liquid oxygen. What's going to happen? Get carbon dioxide. Get what? Get carbon dioxide. You're going to get carbon dioxide. Will it explode? The question was, would you know, this explode? In other words, flower dust with oxygen will explode, or wheat dust, or any of these things. And if I had diamond, three nanometer particle dust, would that explode? I think the answer is no, because what happened there is when diamond hit the liquid oxygen, because diamond is so dense, it couldn't react fast enough. It was limited, basically, by transport. So while it was unstable, and sit there, the diamond just sat on the top. I've seen, I've seen a movie of this. Just sits on top of liquid oxygen, sort of sizzling around like the water drop in the frying pan, until it, all of a sudden there's no more diamond left. So it didn't explode. Yes? Could you tell us which impurity causes the whole diamond to glow red instead of blue? Well, we, we don't, the answer is no, I didn't tell you, and that's because we don't understand it yet. We believe boron is the acceptor in this donor acceptor <coughs> recombination. But from the energetics and the spectroscopy, the donor doesn't match to many of the known donor states that we see in diamond. And so we still don't have a good model for what's going on for all of these bands. The, six, the, the red band, the 660 band, clearly involves more. I have strong evidence for that. But there's something else there. And I think the diamond is too atomically dense to, to, uh, to be host to that's a very good question. One of the problems, uh, I want to expand on the answer to actually help. It is so atomically dense, we can get very few atoms into it. Boron will fit in, nitrogen will fit in, silicon will fit in with a vacancy, nickel will fit in with a vacancy, hydrogen can fit in and actually move in the lattice, carbon interstitials can be made and they move around. Vacancies are not mobile in time until you get to about eight or 900 degrees C. When I say this lattice is cold, not much moves in it. But carbon is this perverse atom. It can form not just sp3 bonds, but sp2, et cetera. That's why we have graphite, we have graphene, we have you know, all these different lucky balls, et cetera. So with a wide band gap material like diamond, that's why it's optically transparent, any of these defects that might be in the middle of the band gap causing the color do not need to be impurities. They could just be dislocation-related or other forms of carbon bonding. 
you know, you can think of the linear polyene chains that might be in there that become the chromophores. I see the secretary here madly writing notes. <laughs> well, I, I do have a question. Um, <laughs> at the bottom of page two, you uh, talk about the NB center. Yes. The molecule inside the dot. And N is nitrogen. What is B? It's a vacancy. It's a lack of carbon. So if each of these black balls was a carbon atom, then I might have a nitrogen for one of them. And adjacent to it, there would be a missing carbon atom. That's what we call a vacancy. Actually, one of the neat things I heard about at a conference about a month ago is there actually an NV center is being used as a magnetometer on the end of atomic force microscopes now for little image magnetic fields in molecules. Thank you very much. I'd like to present you with this framed announcement. It's the announcement of your lecture, signed by all the members of the General Committee. Thank you so much for delivering the lecture tonight. Thank you very much.